Good morning, everyone. It's so good to see everyone this morning. Hey, uh, if you're out in the lobby, come on in. We're going to get started here. We're actually going to start off this morning a little bit differently. We're going to uh, just have a a really quick moment of silence um, for our, our saints in the house. Um, you know, it just goes to show that uh, excellent, strategic, well-played defense really wins the game um, a couple weeks ago. And so, hey, today is Super Bowl Sunday. Anybody ready for some football? Yeah? Do we have any Patriot fans in the house? Bunch of cheaters. Awesome. Great. Awesome. Good to see you guys. We've got a prayer team down in front after the service for you. Uh, any Rams fans in the in the house? Rams, let's go. Hey, uh, we're going to start today off by playing a game because it's Super Bowl Sunday. It wouldn't be Super Bowl Sunday without a fun game. So if you are a fanatic football fan, I need two people, two fanatic football fans to join me up here on stage. Raise your hand. Oh, we got... Come on, dude. I saw you. Saw the hand. I need one more. One more fanatic football. Sir, get on up here. Get a, give them a round of applause as they make it up on stage here. We're going to have a great morning. Well, it's Super Bowl Sunday. We're going to get some introductions here. Some handshakes. All right. What's your name, sir? Jarris. Jarris. Good to meet you. Do you have a team you're rooting for? Um, I'm, I'm rooting for commercials today. Commercials! More commercial fans than football fans in here today. Uh, all the football fans are at home getting ready for the Super Bowl. Sir, what's your name? Leo. 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 Give it up for Leo. Now, Leo, do you have a favorite team in the Super Bowl? Rams. The Rams. All right, guys, join me up here on stage. I'm going to tell you the game that we're playing today. The game that we're playing today is called... The pep talk challenge. Now, we know that uh, during the halftime, we have a fantastic show out on the field. But there is also a show that's happening in the locker rooms. And that's the coaches giving their team a pep talk for the last half of the game. Now, today's scenario is your team is down by 67 points. Okay? This is your team. And you got to get them riled up, get them ready for that second half. Each of you are going to get 30 seconds to give your team a a pep talk. Now, it wouldn't be a challenge without some sort of twist, right? Now, you guys are going to be looking at this screen right here. There are going to be images that pop up. And you have to incorporate what's in these images into your pep talk. You guys understand? All right. Jairus, you're going to go first here. Sorry about it, man. Leo, get ready. Your time's going to start here pretty soon. Sir, here's your microphone. On the count of three, you're going to go 30 seconds. Here we go. One, two, three. Pep talk challenge. All right. So we're down 67 points. Okay. Well, the second half, we could score 67. They scored 67. So we got to start. One point at a time. When we snap the ball, we're going to go one apple, two apple, three apple. And then, Smith, I want you to go flight to the right. I want you to go up the sideline. You're going to pirouette like a ballerina. Woo! Let's go! And then those blockers, they're going to come tumbling down like a pile of Jenga. Now, I don't want to see a bunch of sad puppies around here. Yes! I want to see you zoom, zoom, zoom like Let's Night Rider zoom right to the end Let's zone. Go! Let's get charged up. Time. Woo! Give it up for Darius. Are you guys ready for some football? All right. Leo. <laughs> Just pacing around. Someone needs to give this guy a pep talk. Leo, I'm going to hand this over. I just prayed over it for you. Just lost my voice. Just lost your voice. Okay, well, you better find it because on the count of three, 
It's your pep talk challenge. Here we go. One, two, three. Let's go. Listen, men, today is the day. This is the year. It's time to turn this thing on. We got to start acting like football players and not like extraterrestrials. Huh? Yeah. Do you hear me, E.T.? Yeah. This is ridiculous. We got to work. We got to fight. We got to fight like Cassius Clay, like Muhammad Ali. It's time to get out there and box, Chewbacca. <laughs> Chewbacca, yes. Let's go give it everything we got. Have you guys quit acting like a bunch of little old ladies giving peace signs, okay? <laughs> huh? That's not going to win you a championship. This is your year. Three, let's go out there and let's get two, after it. One time. Leo, great job. Hey, we're going to leave it up to the team on who they think gave them the best pep talk. Now, if you think it's Jairus, give him a holler. All right, Jairus. Now, if you think it was Leo over here, give him a holler. I think, it's, I think Jairus, you win the pep talk challenge. Guys, thank you so much for playing with us this morning. I'm gonna find you guys because I can't seem to find the cards that I have for you. But there are uh, some B-dubs to uh, uh, give cards for your snacks at your parties today. Thank you so much for playing with us. We've got a great service for you guys this morning. My name's Paul, I'm one of the pastors here on staff. If you're new with us, we like to have fun around here. We like to have a good time, but we also love Jesus because we believe Jesus is for everyone. And uh, we'd love to meet you guys here. So after the service, head out uh, to our lobby, to the hub. We'd love to meet you, shake your hand, um, and just get to, to know you a little bit before you take off today. One quick announcement for you guys this morning is that next week, February 10th, uh, Sunday, February 10th, uh, we've got a LoveWorks informational meeting. Now, uh, LoveWorks is our uh, global and local initiatives, um, mission trips, and so we've got a handful of mission trips throughout the year. And so if you would like uh, to know more about how to get involved with that, maybe you want to go on a trip, we'd love to meet you next week, February 10th, at our noon service. And so be sure to stop by... Um, uh, the Student Center next week, or if you have any questions this week, stop by the Hub. Actually, Allie, our very own Allie Osugi here, she's actually leading one of the trips here in the summer. She's going to be in the Hub after service if you have any questions for her. Uh, we've got a great service, like I said. Chris, Lauren, and the band, they're going to lead us in some more songs. And in just a little bit, we're continuing our series, Lo uh, Losing Your Religion. Joel's going to be out here with a great sermon for you. Uh, but why don't you guys stand up, say hello to somebody around you, tell them who you're rooting for today on Super Bowl Sunday. We are under one name No one is lost or goes unseen Cause we are loved by our King Come on! This is not the Norman
hear my cry when every word is left your spirit brings and fills my lungs again God, we are so thankful that through every circumstance of our lives, God, that, God, that you are faithful and that you are true, God, that we can trust you. God, and I know for, for some of us this morning, 
God, as we walk into this place, we feel somewhat undeserving. And maybe that's not just this morning, God. Maybe that, that's a normal state or a normal thought for us in this life. God, so we come before you this morning and just ask that you would remind us that despite anything that is happening in our lives, God, whether we caused it or it's been caused to us, God, God, that your love prevails in our life. God, that it conquers all and that through everything, God, you love us more than we could ever imagine. In Jesus' name, amen.
My deepest doubts in one God, just standing with your arms wide open, wide open. Amen. Well, thank you so much for being here with us, for starting this off. Such a fun morning, such a great time to sing together. Go ahead and take a seat. And as we continue our worship today, I'm gonna actually invite our volunteers forward as we give of our tithes and our offerings. Well, today uh, we're continuing our series. It's actually the fourth part of the series, but it's really part 3B uh, because it's a continuation of last week. Uh, I'll get back to that in just a second. But if you haven't been with us, uh, we've been talking about the fact that religion has a problem. And the problem is it's not just Christianity, but uh, people seem to be leaving religion. In fact, in America, the fastest growing category, religious category is the nuns, not like the Catholic nuns, but the N-O-N-E-S nuns, meaning that they have uh, no religious affiliation uh, on the national survey year after year. For the last 10 years, uh, this is by far the fastest growing category. And um, the things that the people that are in category, the category of uh, no religious affiliation, the things they're pushing back against when they're asked, the things that they they actually are rejecting that they're walking away from are actually things that, uh, as we talked about in this series, are things that we should walk away from as well uh, in some respect. And if you haven't been with us, I'd love for you to go back and review. Um, but we've been getting some great feedback in this series. In fact, uh, we've been talking a little bit about the lists and about religion and, and, and how Jesus came to replace religion. And I got a really, really fantastic question. I, I got a bunch of great emails, but uh, a really fantastic question. The question was, um, if all religion leads to failure, uh, what's the point of the whole Old Testament? And if you ever wondered that, uh, if you ever thought, gosh, I never thought about that, but that's a really good point. Um, we're actually going to talk about that next week, so I hope you'll come back and join us for that uh, next week. But last week, uh, we, we basically addressed this issue, and this is a little bit of review because, again, today is a little bit of the second part of last week's message, um, uh, is that Christians have it all right. This is the, the, one of the, the, the primary criticisms of Christians, that they think they have it all right, and all the religions are wrong. The problem with that is, we, we talked last week, is um, all religi religions can't be completely wrong because there's so much overlap, not only just with other religions, but with other religions in Christianity, as C.S. Lewis uh, pointed out. Um, there's at least these eight things that all made the world's major religions, including uh, Native American beliefs, uh, the ancient uh, Chinese, ancient Greeks, uh, had in common. And, and this handful of things uh, sort of shows a common place and a common ground that often is used by people to say that all religions lead to the same place. That because their lists are similar, if you sort of jump on at some point, all of these places, all of these roads, all these paths, they lead to the same place, probably after death, but they lead to the same place. 
And while I don't agree with that, um, I agree that all religions lead to at least one place. And this was sort of the point of last, last week's message. And, and the thing we camped out on is that all religions at, at least lead to failure. That no matter what the list is, no matter what the religion is, everybody in every system fails to keep up the list. And that's why we have religion. It helps us to know what do we do when there's missteps, when there's sin, when we fail to keep up the religious system that we're in. And this is where, as we said last week, this is where the roads diverge. This is where they go in, in different places. Last week, we said all other religions, um, they, they expose condemnation. It was a big church word we used last week that, that all other religions help us to realize that there's a penalty, that there's a, a problem that we, that we have in, in our shortcomings and that there's a verdict against us and they offer a way for us to redeem ourselves. That's religion. That's what religion does. That may be the type of religion you grew up in. There's certain things you have to do to get right with God. There's certain, a certain set of things that you have to do in order for God to be uh, accepting of you or for you to be in right standing with God. But Jesus eliminated condemnation. He eliminated the, the need for us to keep up the list, keep up the rules, and he offered to redeem us himself. There was no, if you will, I will. If you'll continue to, I'll continue to. What we saw last week is that uh, the scripture teaches us that what the law was powerless to do, with the list, our list, the religious list that was given to the Jewish people, that's sort of the heritage of our, our faith. What the law was powerful, the, powerless to do, God did by sending his own son. Now, Today and next week, I'll just warn you for this, I'm gonna push you a little bit harder. And for those of you that the weather kept away or that the Super Bowl kept away today, you'll probably be a little happy about that. But it's gonna be a little bit difficult. It's gonna be a little bit more uncomfortable, specifically today. And specifically, if you're somebody who's been a Christian, you've been around Christianity for a long time, if, um, if you are new to church or new to faith, somebody brought you for the first time, you probably never saw yourself saying this, but some of the things we're gonna say today, you might actually shout amen in church for the first time ever. Like, I think that might be possible for you. Um, because what we're gonna talk about today, today is the fact that the claims of Christianity seem to be narrow and unfair and exclusive. How is it possible that Jesus is the only way I mean, you can't learn your way or earn your way or do good your way or meditate your way or behave your way any other way to be right with God. I mean, how is that possible? How is it that Jesus is the only way? One of the things that's uncomfortable about Christianity is when you say, this is the way or Jesus is the way, that what, what the fallout of that or what the insinuation of that is that that or some other religion is not the way. If this is the way and this is the only way, then your religion or somebody else's religion or maybe your parents' religion or maybe a new friend's religion, that their religion is not the way. And, and that, that seems a little bit uncomfortable and it can be very uncomfortable. The truth is it also means that there's no other way. It's not only that, 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 that there, some one specific religion is not the right way, it's that there's no other way. If there's only one way, if this is the only way, there's no other way. But my question is, what about good people who just can't embrace all of the Bible or specifically parts of the Bible, maybe some of the Old Testament, they have a hard time uh, reconciling with science. What about people who've never heard the message of Jesus? What about people who were hurt by Christians? I mean, isn't that super unfair? What about people who have never had access to the Bible, or have no Bible, or didn't have anybody to help them understand the Bible? Here's, here's the thing. This is the criticism of Christianity is, doesn't that seem unfair? Doesn't that seem unfair? I mean, come on, if, if we're gonna be honest and we're gonna be intellectually honest, I mean, to some degree, that seems unfair. At the very least, it's uncomfortable, especially when you get in conversation and you're in conversation with somebody and you know they've been believing something their whole life and their whole family and their heritage and generation after generation after generation have, have embraced something. It's hard to at least engage in a conversation and go, hey, here's what we believe. This is, there's only one way and there's a the way and his name is Jesus. And all other ways are the wrong ways. That seems incredibly narrow. It seems unfair. It seems exclusive. And it's easy to assume that if something is unfair and uncomfortable, then it must be untrue. You've had conversations like this. You have conversations with people specifically about religion, and, and, and it just doesn't seem fair. It doesn't reconcile in their mind. It makes them uncomfortable as it relates to somebody they know, a personal relationship, and I'm not minimizing this, somebody they love who believes something different or believes something slightly different or their faith isn't solely in Jesus, and you're wondering, like, what happens to that person? Where do they go? Like, 
Are they okay with God? I mean, it seems unfair and it's definitely uncomfortable. And when things are unfair and uncomfortable, we, we tend to dismiss them as if they're not true. But in, in that line of thinking, under that rationale, things are only true or they're only believable if they're fair and comfortable, right? And, and under that system, something, in order for it to be, to be true, it has to be fair and comfortable, which we know is not the case because the Rams are playing in the Super Bowl today. <laughs> and this week, the NFL came out and said that the officials made a mistake and it was unfair to the Saints, It was unfair to Drew Brees, and the truth is, is they deserve to be playing the Super Bowl. Now, that's really uncomfortable if you're one of the officials. It's super uncomfortable if you're the Rams, because you're basically saying, our governing body, the NFL, said we don't deserve to play in this game, that we've worked all season, we've worked really hard, at no fault of ours, we didn't make the the call on the play. You're basically saying, we're not qualified to play in the Super Bowl, but guess what? The Rams are playing in the Super Bowl. It's true. The reality is, is somebody wanted to cheer for the Rams back there, but didn't feel like that was the right, the right moment. That's okay. Uh, you can cheer for the Rams, uh, even though they're not deserving of being in the Super Bowl. It's okay. <laughs> Just kidding. I'm not, a, I'm not even a Saints fan. So, uh, um, but here's the thing. Unfair and uncomfortable is not a good argument for anything, especially something being untrue. In fact, it's a reality, isn't it? It's a reality that mature adults realize And we embrace. That's why we tell our kids life's not fair. It's reality. There are certain things in life that aren't fair. Beyond that, you know that in some ways, life has been far more than fair to your kids. Because some of you, like me, you've seen unfair and uncomfortable up close, uncomfortably up close. Some of you have been on mission trips to third world countries. Our partner, Somebody Cares, in, in Malawi, Africa, serve some of the people in the poor, one of the poorest countries in the world, top three every year, poorest countries in the world. There's kids in that, those communities who, are gonna, who are, are, are gonna either because of malnourishment or, or because of disease aren't even gonna make it to their teenage years. And, and we, we look at that and we go, gosh, that's so unfair. And when you think about all that we have, it's uncomfortable, There's people, I'll make you more uncomfortable for a second. There's people who live four hours from here who live across an invisible line that could be soon a really non-invisible line, but it's an invisible line. And the truth is, is because they live beyond that invisible line, they have far less opportunity, they have far less freedom, and they live in a much more corrupt system than all of we do. And and the, the the truth is, is they were just unfortunate enough to be born across an invisible line. In our community, some of you know this, in the foster care system, there are 15,000 orphan kids suffering the consequences of being born to parents who could not or would not care for them in the way they needed to be cared for. Now, here's the thing. All of that is unfair. All of that is uncomfortable. And all of that is true. It's 100% true. Unfair and uncomfortable does not equal untrue. Unfair and uncomfortable, let's try this one more time, does not equal, there we go, does not equal untrue. It just doesn't. Now, this doesn't make Christianity true. This doesn't prove Christianity. But here's the thing. It does address an argument that many of you have found yourself in the middle of many times. You found yourself in the middle of an argument that steers away from the most important question. Week two of the series, we talked about the most important question is, who is Jesus? And what's true about Jesus? And was Jesus the son of God? And was he able to accomplish what he said he he could accomplish? But the truth is, is that this argument right here often leads us away from the most important questions. And it often gets us sidetracked in the midst of logic that sort of on the surface seems like it makes sense. But when you really think about it, you really think about the world, we don't really embrace that line of thinking any other way. On top of that, and this is what I really wanna address today. On top of that, The problem is it severely underestimates the significance of our sin and the consequences of our sin. Now, we talked about this a few weeks ago, and I'll just prepare you real quick. If you have a Bible, we're gonna go go to Romans chapter five in just a minute. Romans chapter five, we're gonna look at a really important truth related to this whole argument. But here's the thing. Last week, we looked at the list, and and we talked about lists of all religions. And, And here's what we know. 
Everybody falls short of the list. We proved that last week. If you weren't here, we had a little bit of a a participation uh, in the sermon and everybody stood up and we got to the very first thing on the list and everybody had to sit down because we all broke the list. We didn't even get to number two. There was one or two people that got to number two, but they had to sit down because they were lying. So they broke number two on the list. And so the the thing is, is here's what we know. Everybody falls short of the list. Here's the problem with that. We know everybody falls short of the list. We just think there's a lot of people that fall way shorter than the, of the list than we do. And we don't see ourselves as like way below the list. We don't see ourselves as, you know, way below perfect. We see ourselves as not that bad. We're not perfect, but we're just a few notches below perfect. We're not like, you know, really, really great, but we're just a few notches below. In fact, we don't even call our sin, sin, do we? We don't. We call them mistakes. Come on, affairs, dishonesty, Selfishness, betrayal, mistakes, that's crazy. I mean, that's just, that's just in our own minds trying to reconcile the world and our behavior and we look at people next to us and, and here's what happens. Then we turn on the TV and we see something imaginable, some imaginable, unimaginable crime that happens and we think, what kind of evil people are there in this world? Isn't it true? We all think that. I'm including myself. I'm not pointing a finger. We all do this. The problem is, is, What we don't recognize is what's in that person that caused them to do that evil thing is just a more mature version, a less tame, less disciplined version of the same thing that's inside of each one of us. Here's my question is, what if if all religions are right? Like, let's go back to this thing. What if the list, what if the list really, you know, let's just, just entertain this for a second. What if the list is really the, the thing that God's holding us to? What if God's put these things in our heart? That's why we find them in all, the, all different religions. What if this list is really what we're being held to and breaking this list is what condemns us? What if this, breaking this list is what makes us guilty before God? This is important. Do you really want God to be fair? You see, we're all about fairness. Oh, it's not fair, it's not fair, it's not fair. But when you put ourselves in the situation, we realize we're guilty. The scripture says we were condemned. We broke the rules. If we want it to be fair and it's about the list and we're gonna take everybody's list, okay, we're gonna measure against the list. Do we really want God to be fair? Do you really want God to give you what you deserve? We don't. We don't want fair. We want mercy. We want grace. We want forgiveness. There is no comfortable way to address sin any more than there's a comfortable comfortable way to address cancer. You don't evaluate a doctor when it it comes to to cancer. You don't evaluate a doctor based on how comfortable uh, his uh, procedure is gonna be or how how comfortable his diagnosis or how comfortable um, the the treatment is he's gonna give you. You evaluate him based on how effective it is. You don't care about how comfortable it is. You don't care uh, about how easy it's gonna be. You don't care if it's the same treatment he gives everybody else. What you wanna know is that he understands your situation and he is gonna deal with your situation in a way that's effective. Here's what I'm gonna say. Even even though it's not a question of fairness, here's my opinion. Jesus, this is in the Bible. We're about to go to the Bible in just a second. Jesus offered the most fair and most comfortable solution for an unfair and uncomfortable world. There is no perfectly fair and no comfortable situation, no fair and comfortable way to deal with the sin and brokenness of our world. But Jesus, he addressed and he offered a solution for the mo- for in the most fair way possible, in the most comfortable way possible in an unfair and uncomfortable world. And he gave us the freedom to reject it if we didn't wanna receive his offer. If you have your Bibles open, uh, Romans chapter five, we're gonna start in verse six. If you don't have your Bible or device, device open, I'm gonna put the words right here on the screen. This is what Paul said. He said, you see, here's the thing. At just the right time, when we were still powerless, God died for the ungodly. When we were still powerless, when we were still in dire straits, when we were still in difficulty. Now, very rarely, he goes on, he says, very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person. I mean, they don't need it. Though a good person sometimes might possibly dare to die. You might possibly dare to die for a good person. But he's gonna say, here's the thing. You're not righteous. He's, uh, he claimed in a different place to be righteous among all the Jews. He followed the law better than anybody else. And he said, I'm not righteous. You're not righteous. The truth is, is I'm not even really good. The righteous don't need God's help. And the good, while they deserve it, that's not really us. Here's how we know. He says this. 
But God demonstrated his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, while we were desperate, while we were in difficulty, while we were in over our heads, while we were in a situation that we couldn't bail ourselves out of, you know what Christ did? He didn't strike a deal. I mean, he didn't see us in peril. He didn't see us in a, in a difficult situation and go, you know what, now's the time. I've got him right where I want him. I'm gonna strike a deal. I'm gonna get everything that I want. Christ didn't do that. He didn't take advantage of us in, 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 our, in our difficulty. And he didn't leverage it against us. Do you know what, who strikes a deal and do you know who leverages it against us and takes advantage? Do you know who does that? Religion. The enemy working to pervert things that are true about God, that are true about the world, to pervert those things, cause people, maybe evil people, as we all are, to leverage a system, to leverage religion, to manipulate, to control. And when they do so, because of a lack of understanding of the true gospel, they take advantage of us. They take advantage of weak people. They take advantage of people who don't know any better. But the Bible says, Paul says, that while we were still sinners, Jesus didn't do any of that. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He died for us. Now, here's the thing. You've heard this over and over and over. And, and, and it doesn't fall on you as super powerful today. But when you realize the situation that we were in and what Christ could have done, what God could have done, and then you contrast that with the fact that he came and saw some difficulty and he paid the price for our difficulty with his own life. Do you know what's powerful about this? If you think about it from Paul's perspective, who's penning these words, Paul's literally saying, while I was still a sinner, in fact, probably while I was sinning, somewhere in the vicinity of where Christ was crucified, he died and he gave his life for me. You know what's true for you? Is that when Christ, even though he knew about your worst day, when you think of your worst moment, when you think of something that you would categorize as a bit more than a mistake, when you think of your sin, when you think of your brokenness, here's what you need to know is that when Christ thought of that, he thought of it as he died for you. So this is the question I have is, is that fair? I mean, is it fair that an innocent man had to give his life for people who made mistakes, who sinned, who are broken? Heck no. That's amazing. That's grace. That's mercy. That's sacrifice. And we're so glad, aren't we? We're so glad that it was unfair in our favor. We want to debate fairness all the time, but here's what's true. We're so glad it was unfair in our favor. It reminded me years ago, um, uh, I, it's the second week in a row, uh, my, my 90-year-old grandmother's going to make it into the sermon. She's sitting down here in the front row. Um, but my grandmother years ago, yeah, yeah, we can cheer for her being 90 years old. <laughs> years ago, we were playing Monopoly and uh, with her. And she's like the matriarch of our family, godly woman, amazing, you know, incredible woman. And it was all the grandkids we were playing. Um, it, she's, she's my grandmother. My kids call her great grand. But um, she, we were playing Monopoly with my grandmother. And we were mercilessly whipping her in Monopoly. Like she was at a point to where like it's, you know, it's near the end of the game and all of her hotels and, and houses and properties are mortgaged. You know, if you play Monopoly, she has no cash and it's, it looks like she's basically one roll from being out of the game. And so she rolls and she lands, believe it or not, luckily she lands on the community chest. You know what I'm talking about? And she gets this card, right? Which is when you're in a bad situation in Monopoly, that's what you want. You want, you want to be on a safe place. You don't want to land anybody else's property. It's like, okay, I need to either get on chance or I need to get on community chest or I need that go directly to go, you know, get, do that thing, get, collect 200. So she, she gets bank error in your favor, collect 200. And you know what my grandmother says? She says, oh, maybe I will roll again. That's not fair. Like, it's not fair that I get $200. I mean, I'm not, you guys are beating me in the game and, you know, fairly beating me in the game. I'm not doing, the, doing well. Maybe I should roll again. I can't, I can't take the $200. <laughs> Do you know what's so unbelievable about that? Is the fact that it's so unbelievable because it never happened. I made the whole thing up. That's never happened. Not even for my sweet great Graham. Nobody ever does that. Here's why. We never debate fairness when something is unfair in our favor. We never debate fairness. 
when something's unfair in our favor. No one ever be, complains about being given a better deal on a purchase than may somebody, maybe somebody else got. You don't complain about an insider tip when you're going to an event about how to have a better experience. You don't complain about having an advantage over your competition or getting a head start in your finances or a head start in life or a head start in a career by somebody where you got to leapfrog a whole bunch of other people because you knew somebody. Nobody ever complains about that. And we don't complain about having food to eat when there's other people that don't or being safe when other people aren't. Because people never complain when things are unfair in our favor. Fairness is not a good argument for or against anything. Jesus offered a just system. In fact, he offered the most just system. Here's, how, here's, here's Jesus' system. Here's the thing. Everybody qualifies for his offer. Jesus came and he offered his life for yours and mine. He offered a sacrifice for our sin. And all you have to do to qualify is be a sinner. Now, this is important. You can't be a mistaker, okay? If you're a mistaker or you think I'm pretty good or I'm okay or, you know, I don't necessarily need him or I'm not, I'm not you know, I'm not unrighteous, you know, I, I'm, I'm pretty good, I'm a righteous person, you don't qualify. The good news is someday you'll discover you're not just a mistaker, None of us are. We're all sinners. As we discovered last week, there was a verdict that was made against us, a penalty that we all deserved. And the truth was, Jesus came to offer something to every single one of us, and everyone qualifies. I can't think of a more fair system than everybody qualifies. Everybody not only qualifies, everybody gets in the same way. You get in through grace. You don't get in through a different, you know, grace plus some things that you do. You don't earn anything from God. It's not like, you, you know, Jesus is grace, but wait a minute, you went a little too far. I mean, you're, you're a big mistaker. Like, you're not just a little mistaker. You're a big mistaker, so we need some extra to take care of you, and there's some other things you have to do. I mean, that's just not the way the system works. Everybody qualifies. Everybody gets in the same way, and everybody can meet the requirement. The requirement is simply faith. Now, is there a more fair, more comfortable system in the whole world? I've never seen it. I don't believe it exists. Is it narrow? It is. But it's not exclusive. In fact, the offer of Jesus is radically inclusive. It's a radically inclusive invitation. Think about the most famous verse that comes to mind. In fact, there's probably a Vegas odds to be bet on how many times John 3.16 will be on the camera today during the Super Bowl, okay? I'm sure you can bet on that. As twisted and weird as that is, but I bet you can bet on that. And we all know what it says. For God so loved the world. The whole world. For God so loved the whole world that he gave his only son that Whosoever or whoever, depending on which tradition you grew up in and which Bible translation you use, for everyone who believes, they won't perish, but they'll have eternal life. They'll be made right with God. It's fair to say that it's narrow. In fact, Jesus said it. Some of you remember this. He said this. He said, wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. That is, that there's a whole bunch of people, people that you and me that we know and that we love, some of us have been on the wide road. And the truth is, is there's lots of people on the, the wide road. And that road leads to destruction. And small, he says, small is the gate. But narrow is the road that leads to life, the life I've come for you to experience, the true thriving life that you can experience in this life and the life to come. And only a few find it. It's offered all. It's only discovered by a few. But make no mistake, religion is exclusive. Jesus was radically inclusive. Religion says this. Religion says, once you believe, you can belong as long as you behave. Isn't that true? Some of you grew up in a church like that. You grew up in a church that said, look, once you believe this, then you're in. Then you can belong. Then you can be part of us. But you have to behave. If you don't behave a certain way, if we catch you doing a certain thing, you're out. And you're not only out of this church, you're out. We're gonna tell you you're out with God. There's no way you're in with God because you have to believe and you have to, in order to belong, and you have to behave. And that's the system that religion, all religion, it doesn't matter. Show me the religions, all the religions. You can say it's narrow. You can't say it's exclusive. As Jesus says this, he said, here's my system. It's radically inclusive. Come follow me, he says. Whoever believes in me will have eternal life. 
Jesus invited and Jesus included people who were nothing like him to follow him. He included and he invited people who were nothing like him to believe in him, to join him in his mission. Jesus spent time with people who were nothing like him. And it wasn't the religious leaders. In fact, he spent less time with the religious leaders than he did the mistakers, the big mistakers, the people that, that the society had sort of pushed aside and really had shunned. You've heard me say this before. Here's what I think when it comes to church. I think we should do everything short of sin to make sure everyone knows that they're invited and they're included. I think we should do everything short of sin to make sure everyone knows, again, whether it's narrow or not, whether it seems unfair or not, whether it seems uncomfortable or not, I think we should, we should be bold in our invitations. We should be bold in our inclusions. That means that there's certain environments that we're gonna get in, certain circles that we're gonna be in, maybe in groups, maybe on teams. There's gonna be certain circles and we're gonna be tempted when certain people don't behave a certain way to wonder whether they belong or not. Here's what's true about that. Is when we do that, we just see ourselves as a little bit less than perfect. And we see them way down here. We see them and judge them and look at them in a way that Christ didn't. The truth is, is we're all way below perfect. We're all not just mistakers. We're not just people that are a little bit less than perfect. We're not good people that are, that are trying to make our way and, and you know, some are better than others and so some need more help than others. That's, none of that's true. The truth is, is all sinned and all fell short of the standard the glory, the holiness, the perfection that was required of us to be in right standing with God. All of us betrayed. Now, if you're here today and you're somebody who's sort of new to church or you came because somebody invited you and, or you're in town or you're hanging out with them for the Super Bowl and you braved the, the weather or you're watching online today and somebody's told you to check out this series that you sort of, this is different and you're bothered by the narrow claims of Jesus, I get that and I'm okay with that. But I want you to be clear, it is narrow, but it's not exclusive. And it's an invitation that really is for everyone. When we say we're for everyone, that's what we mean, is Jesus was for everyone. Jesus changes everything for everyone. The truth is, is there's nobody in here who Jesus' work on the cross, Jesus' forgiveness, the, the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives is more effective than others because of things we've done in our lives. Jesus is not, his power is not restricted by how good or bad you are. We were all sinful and it's effective for all of us. And if you're somebody who's here and you're bothered by sort of the narrow claim, that's okay that you think it's narrow. It's not exclusive, but here's what I want you to remember. Unfair and uncomfortable does not mean it's untrue. To this unfair and uncomfortable world, God sent his son. And when he sent his son, he went far beyond fair. And he went far beyond comfortable. In fact, Jesus was the one who made himself uncomfortable. And he did so to offer to everyone the possibility of life and eternal life forever. Here's what I hope. My hope is that as you're wrestling this issue to the ground, whether you're somebody who's been walking as a believer for a long time or whether you're somebody who's brand new to church, that as you encounter this idea that this can't be true because it's unfair and it's uncomfortable, you'll recognize that the system, that the offer of Jesus was far more than fair to you. In fact, it was unfair in our favor in the favor of every single person on earth. And I hope you'll wrestle to the ground. Not the issue is, is it fair? Is it comfortable? I hope you'll wrestle to the ground. Is it true? Is, how, how can I be confident that Jesus was who he said he was and that he was able to accomplish what he was able to be accomplished, he was able to accomplish? How can I be absolutely certain of that fact that Jesus was who he, says he, who, who he said he was and that he in his offer, he could actually come through on that offer. That's gonna be our topic for next week. And I hope you'll join us. Let me pray for us. God, I pray for somebody who's here today or maybe somebody uh, who's watching online or somebody who's wrestled with this issue for a long time. They look around the world and they look at different world religions and they look at different belief systems and they just think, gosh, what would a really merciful God do? What would a really fair God do? What would be something that would make this 
make sense to me and reconcile the fact that there's lots of people that believe a lot of different things and they're really smart people and they seem to be people that are pursuing God in different ways. I pray today that you would help us to realize that your offer was free and it was for everyone and that there isn't any more fair system in the world than a system that offers free entry for everyone, that offers grace as forgiveness for all of our sins, that reconciles us to God based on the work of one man, the one man who came to offer us that life, the new life and the eternal life in himself. God, I pray for somebody who's here today and they've wrestled with this issue and they've wrestled with this fairness and this, this idea of this, this makes them uncomfortable and maybe it's related to a, a family member or a friend who believes something different. I pray that you'd give them the boldness, but, but the boldness and the compassion to continue to be radically inclusive as it relates to the claims of their savior. Pray for somebody who's here today that maybe for the first time is recognizing, you know what, the reason I was pushing back is because I just, it felt, it, there, were, there were certain parts of this, it just felt unfair or it felt uncomfortable. I pray that you would help them to recognize two things today. The depth of their need as not someone who's a mistaker, but someone who's a sinner. Like everybody they're seated around, that they would recognize that they're a sinner. And there's somebody who needed rescuing. And what they got was not fair. What they got was amazing grace in Jesus. And I pray in his name. Amen. Amen. I hope you enjoy the rest of your Super Bowl Sunday. We'll see you next week. Been turned to rain. Is there anyone?